I welcome you to this special Africa working session on technology and digital innovation of the World Trade Organization Public Forum 2022. But most importantly, we want to be able to dialogue and create a, path, a, a, a pathway for determining what it's like to be able to advance trade on the continent, harnessing the potentials in digital innovation and technology. And the, our organizers for this session is Dynamics Impact Advisory, an advisory frame that um, are the front hub advising governments, advising institutions, businesses on um, issues relating to international trade, investments, and accessing global market with particular focus on the African continent. Our co-organizer is the Youth Bridge Foundation and um, the African Youth and Governance Convergence. So the African Youth Con and Governance Convergence is an initiative of the Youth Bridge Foundation. About two months ago, yes, we had the uh, conference talking about harnessing digital innovation and how youth can be at the forefront of driving this change, looking at the African continent. And now we're looking at this in the context of trade, in the context of um, sustainable agenda of the continent, talking about the Agenda 2063 of the African that we want. So I will just go through quickly some of the... Um, key point that was raised at the African Youth and um, Governance Conference, which aired earlier. And um, the conference touched on at the representation of 20 African countries from diaspora. And then it was focused on how we can address digital innovation and technology leveraging innovations from youth to ensure sustainable recovery. And that has led us to the discussion today now talking in the context of trade how can we harness the potentials of um, digital innovation and technology, leveraging the innovations from youth, taking examples from the multilateral system, taking examples from um, people who are drivers and implementers of um, things, that initiative that's got to do with trade on the continent. And that is why we're having this discussion today. And um, without much ado, I'll introduce our speakers. So with me on the panel today, I have Olori Boyajai, the president of Borderless Trade Network. So with me, I also have Jan Hoffman, who is the head of the Trade and Logistics Division of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, particularly the Division on um, Technology and Logistics. And with me, I also have Adebayo Adeleke, who is the CEO of Supply Chain Africa. And... On the, um, on the flyer, we have Paminda Verhobi, who is a senior advisor of the Village Foundation, who has, driven, who has been at the forefront of driving entrepreneurship agenda on the continent, who is unavoidably absent, and she sends her uh, um, apologies. However, she sends a talking point in terms of things she would have loved to share on the panel today. So with us also gracing this panel today, we have Abiodun Dominic Odinuga, who is an international consultant and also at the forefront of driving youth entrepreneurship in Nigeria. So um, we have an enriching panel, and this panelist will be bringing different perspectives to the discussion today. But before we take the contributions, I mean the presentation from the panelists, I will just go through a few things in terms of what Paminda Ver OBE had um, sent as a talking point, as a focus of our discussion today. So um, in the introduction, she touched on digital, on how digital economies are increasingly growing faster than overall economies, providing greater employment opportunities and innovative services. The adoption of digital technology is also directly linked to boosting productivity and poverty alleviation. And that a 2018 study by the International Telecommunication and, and um, the International Telecommunications Union showed that a 10% increase in mobile broadband penetration would likely result in a 2.5% increase in GDP in low-income economies in West, East, Central, and Southern Africa. Spurred by the COVID-19 pandemic and, on, and an influx of talent, African digital economy is rapidly expanding. And said, our vision for Africa 
The vision for Africa 1.5 billion today, projected to jump to 2.5 billion by 2050, is that all Africans are using advanced technology to solve the continent's biggest challenges. Productive jobs and access to basic services such as healthcare and education, that all Africans have access to quality jobs, better healthcare, and skilled based education. Technology and human beings coexist in a mutually beneficial ecosystem and that technology is regarded as an aid to create a pathway for government, businesses, regulators, NGOs, and general population to close this gap, and that technology is being used as a bridge of growth and prosperity by and through entrepreneurship, including women, um, Africa's future. Examples of how African entrepreneurship are harnessing technology and digital innovation to enhance Africa's social and economic growth so she gave an example of the Waxima Healthcare Digital Platform for non-communicable disease on the continent. Then the Mamoni, connecting low-income women to inclusive financial services in Nigeria. The Mustard Venture Agency on a mission to build better products, better brand, and better perception originating African-focused tech ventures capable of resonating with global audience. Then we have the Help Mom Initiative in Nigeria. They achieved this they, they create um, the reduction of methanol and info they, create, um, they created a software for the reduction of maternal and infant mortality in Nigeria and they achieved this via mobile healthcare technology. Their services include providing clean birth kits to pregnant women in rural undeserved communities at a reduced cost and a vaccination tracker that gives constant reminder for immunization session, thereby preventing vaccine, um, vaccine preventable death. So on statistics, she mentioned that across the African continent, entrepreneurs are already unnecessary technology, like we know, and digital innovation to advance African trade and sustainable development agenda. And here are some statistics to back that up. In 2017, only 25% of people in Africa reporting, reported having internet access. By the end of 2019, there was 526 million broadband connections in Africa. Today, Africa's average broadband penetration is around 39%. And on sectors, African digital technology sector growth has been mainly concentrated in its financial services. In 2018, almost half of all mobile money accounts worldwide were located on the continent. And on economic impact, by the end of 2019, mobile technology and services had contributed, to, contributed $144 billion in economic value and $15.6 billion in taxation contribution in West, in West Africa. And on digital trade, digital trade is transforming economies in some of the most active con countries on the continent. An example is Rwanda, which, which in 2020 was ranked first among East African countries in readiness to use technology for growth and has been seen as the farthest growth in technology services. The subsector has driven growth in other sectors, especially through mobile phones penetration, despite only contributing to around 1.6% of the country's GDP in 2019. Another example is South Africa, which is, leading, which is a leading country for internet usage in Africa, over 54%, and is the continent's most inclusive internet economy with the highest number of internet usage, mobile penetration, and broadband usage on the continent. The country has seen its ICT sector contributed to around 3% of its GDP and 17% of its services exported as of December 2019. E-commerce markets also are major sources of employment, employing an estimated 1.3 million workers and generating revenue of around 3 billion in 2019. Another example is in Nigeria, which has the largest population on the continent, but an overall internet usage of 27.7%, according to the 2018 International Telecommunication Union survey. It is Africa's largest internet economy because of its population and has most tech companies on the classified sectors. In 2018, ICT generated 9.65% of Nigeria's GDP. And as of 2019, Lagos ICT services clustered was valued at around $2 billion. And in Kenya, about 46% of people have access to broadband internet by, by late 2018, and 83% had financial accounts in 2019 due to the popularity of mobile financial services. Kenya sees the largest GDP 
contribution from its internet economy at around 8% than other countries in Africa, leading in digital payments and the highest banking penetration among West African countries. And in Egypt, internet economy is a high-value added sector and one of the most diverse on the continent based on business classification and ownership. With tech companies more evenly distributed, fintech tends to be more to be major player in other African internet economies. The Egyptian government also made significant efforts to digitize its services and platforms. Imagine in the high performing group in the United Nations e government development index, EGDI, as of twenty twenty. This digital adoption in the public sector supports the use of quality data for government decisions and policy making which improves public services delivery. It also builds infrastructure and an enabling environment to encourage the adoption of, digi of digital technology by the private um, sector. Now key sectors that are using, techno um, using technology for digital trade. So we have the financial services sector which are worth over $165 billion in Africa. The agriculture sector, which is an important contributor to Africa's economy, despite often being done on a small scale, has been and continues to be disrupted by digital innovation through services and platforms that provide small orders farmers with information and market access. In 2017, e-commerce was estimated to draw around 21 million online shoppers on the continent. A third of, commerci a third of commercial activity in Africa is informal. Retail in Africa is mainly composed of medium and small scale enterprises, mostly manual and offline, informal, unregistered, and working on various aspects of coordinated value chain. This gap provides avenue for technology companies to digitize a range of processes and systems to transform the sector. And in the health sector, digital channels are providing an avenue for medical services delivery by aggregating healthcare facilities, collecting and analyzing data, designing hospital management service system, and establishing platforms for electronic medical record, and patients billing and payment. The health sector in West African countries is mostly privately funded, with total annual health expenditure reaching around $90 billion dollars but a lack of access to healthcare service and limited data availability all present, all present the challenges that makes the sector poised for technology-driven disruption. And other sectors being propped up by digital innovation in Africa are the transportation sector, where problems such as informal operation and market fragmentation are being addressed by right alien services, digital logistics services, and relevant business management services and the education sector, where tech companies are creating online tutoring service and learning platform. Investments in technology and digital trade in Africa, individual governments, economies are making efforts to increase the investment in digital trade. An example is the Rwandan government that has been involved in supporting local entrepreneurs ecosystem through development of infrastructure such as Kigali Innovation City. In 2019 and 2020, Egypt made investments worth 1.6 billion US dollars in its technology sector and enforced 55 laws and regulations for issues such as cyberspace safety, intellectual property rights, and data protection. And in 2019, the South African government launched a ZARI 1.4 billion SME fund, a public-private partnership to invest in SMEs and startups. And the Kenyan government established the Kenyan Industry Entrepreneurship Project, a 50 million initiative designed to support private sector players such as SMEs, support organizations and startups with grants and technical support between 2019 and 2014. Private sector investment through venture capital funding has also been a major source of investment for African tech companies. Nigeria fintech subsector has attracted significant investment funding, and a recent example is Flutterwave one billion dollars valuation in 2021. In in second quarter of 2022, 1.2 1.26 billion dollars was raised in African tech ecosystem from 180 deals, despite a worldwide decline in venture capital funding. So, without a doubt. 
will find that we touted out African entrepreneurs and governments are netting technology and digital innovation. But the challenge is how to better consolidate this success. How do we ensure that all sectors, health, education, and agriculture are equally developed and supported by the government and private sector? How do we build the vibrant tech, vibrant tech ecosystem across the continent, especially in fragile and emerging economies? So that is from Prime Minister Obihi, and um, we will take the presentation from our other panelists, and then we'll have a very interesting discussion and I mean, and um, conversation, which is the crux of the um, working session today. So to start with, we're going to be taking the presentation from Olori Boyajai, the president of Borderless Trade Network. Thank you very much, Gwemisola. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for joining this session. I'm really delighted to be here, and um, there are at least, the, you know, I have the support of the BTN women, as we call it, the Borderless Trade Network, uh, for short. Um, in our network, you know, what we do is, is pretty simple. Um, it's a trade promotion organization, and what we, our main objective is to ensure that women in trade um, we increase their participation in international uh, trade, whether that's through export um, or even import as well. Now, as a network, we have at least a thousand people um, who we've been over the last two years pouring a lot of resources into. Uh, for us at BTN, we see ourselves as the bridge between the institutions that want to help women to get into trade, um, as well as the women who also want to be equipped and, you know, developed in order for them to enter into the international markets. Now, um, with regards to our digital um, programs or even uh, footprint for the women, what we found is women are not a homogeneous group. Uh, so you find that there are women in rural areas, there are women in... Um, in the career space, women in business, uh, Miss Me's, you name it. It's like women are across. So we, we couldn't deploy a one-size-fits-all approach, which is one of the things that I hope we can um, really get down to today, which is that technology solutions cannot be a one-size-fits-all. They are good for enabling um, you know, access to markets, access to even finance, if you look at it but we really have to be a bit more detailed in the approach that we give each um, cluster of, of women, whether SMEs or, or um, Miss Me's in themselves. Now, um, our programs are majorly around community type uh, impact or community, um, how would I put it? Like they're community based essentially. So we want it to affect immediate um, uh, communities as opposed to just the one woman. So if we empower one woman, she has to be able to pass that effect, whether it's in the digital solution or even in um, how we empower her business to be able to, to, to quadruple or, or to double in size. Whatever we do for her, she has to pass that on as a solution to others. Now, we've been able to reach over 20,000 people through our programs. Last year, we did tremendous work in development, and a lot of it was based on helping women access markets through existing platforms, for example, Mansa. Um, this is a platform that Afrexim Bank have recently, and they are one of our amazing supporters, partners um, right now. They, they've created the Mansa platform, which is a depository um, uh, a due diligence platform, thank you, a due diligence platform that allows investors from out of Africa to be able to look at businesses and decide for themselves which of these businesses they want to um, do business with, which I think is a fair way to be able to assess someone as opposed to being gender-based. So that way you're able to look at it and say this business actually meets our criteria um, as opposed to, oh, it's run by a woman or a man. Uh, so it's a competence thing, which we found to be very useful. So we onboarded uh, roughly about 500 women onto that platform, which has really, 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 really helped them. Um, we are looking to 
uh, as verifiers and agents of AfroExim Bank, BTN really wants to ensure that we help the women beyond getting on the platform now to engage with the platform. And you find out that sometimes we talk about access to technology, but we never really talk about usage. So this is where literacy comes in. So what we had to do last year, including this year, um, and for the next five years, we really just said we're going to focus on um, uh, digitalization and funding. Those were the two areas that we've decided to stick to for the next five years. We could do many things, but we realized that those two things could really uh, make a big impact if we stick to them. So um, after getting them on platforms such as Mansa, then we decided that, you know what, let's help them with certifications, because you and I know that in order for you to engage in international markets, there's quite a lot of uh, certification documentation and the likes that either they hinder or they um, just is so bureaucratic that you can't penetrate them. So we had to uh, partner with uh, NYSET. NYSET is our local, in Nigeria anyway, uh, by the way, BTN is based in Nigeria, I forgot, uh, apologies. <laughs> um, so we decided to partner with them and what they did for us is because we are a network, they were able to make the lives of these women easier. But what we are proposing to people like NYSET is why can't you digitize your process? Why is it still paper-based? So you find out that some of these agencies that are supposed to help women um, and other Miss Me's get into the market are so backwards in the way they operate that you would be so much better off just not doing any business. That's really what I feel sometimes. And I feel bad because it really shouldn't be that way. Um, nice at claim that they are going to look into digitizing the process, but we don't know how long that's going to take because it's a, it's a, uh, a national agency and um, they have to get the federal go-ahead, I, I suppose. Um, so in that regard, we've also been trying to help the women um, to have fair, I would say, processes in the area of documentation and certification. We have had amazing successes. We were able to also cut the cost. Uh, of these women getting these certifications, which was a big deal for them uh, because it's one thing for you to get your certification, but when it costs literally your whole year's income, then it's no longer, um, you know, it's no longer a, a nice uh, outcome for you as the small business owner. Um, this year, what we've done that I am probably most proud of is we then launched uh, a Go Global with Tech um, program. And our aim with this is really simple. With all the partners that we have, and we have amazing partnerships, I have to admit, whether that's from um, um, DFIs to the local uh, stakeholders in the export space to our promotion council, NEPC, um, but you find out that, you know, sort of coming out now, looking at how we then see how Africa can then begin to um, sort of dive into this um, uh, opportunity. And I just want to use a quick analogy because uh, I grew up in London. You know, in London, there's a, on, the, on the underground, right? The underground, there's the train, and then there's the platform. In between the two of them, it says, mind the gap, right? And personally, when we talk about the digital divide, there's still a gender digital divide. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at two layers for the women, right? I just wanted to point that out. So what I just want to leave everyone with here is we have to mind the gap because the gap for us is two times more than what you know uh, men are actually dealing with. Now, the interesting thing is that platform are the tools, the skills, and the different things that are supposed to help you into the train. So let's assume the train is the digital world. The question is, how are we helping more women to get on the platform into the digital train? so that they can go wherever they want with these tools, with the different things that we claim are supposed to be equally uh, accessible. And um, we all know, and, and I, I mean, I could go on for, for aeons about stats and facts and all those things, but 900 million people are without internet in Africa. 900 million. That's, a, that's, that's staggering, if you ask me. So then you ask yourself when, for example, and I don't really like mentioning names of like these 
corporations, so I'll just stick to corporations, right? Um, when they come and they say, oh, we have this market access tool, my question is, what's the penetration plan for that? How are you going to get that to the rural areas? And how are you going to ensure that the people who need it get it? Now, let me just say this again. On the other side is that in homes in Africa, there is what we call social norms, cultural norms. It means that the husband is more likely to have a phone that has broadband than the wife. Even if she was to have a device that could connect her to this world that we claim is endless, opportunities abound, she probably won't even want to have the phone. Why? Because of the cost. She's going to think twice before she engages in buying internet and data for her to even look at what Google is offering, right? That's on the one hand. Now, on the other hand, um, I think, how many minutes do I have left? Because <laughs> I could go on. But I, I'm just going to wrap up, you know, um, in, 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 in one minute. One of the things we've seen is that trade and investment go together. If you give a woman the opportunity to trade with the world but you don't give her investment, she's going to go flat back to where she came. Um, so one of the interesting things is that we talk about digital innovation and how it can advance Africa's trade and its sustainable agenda, but then we also have to look at how um, digital innovation can also help us as Africa bring in FDI needed for us to run all of these tools. No single woman can afford to get into trade in the digital space without funding. It is impossible. She, will, she would want it, but then she'd be looking at it like a five-year-old who can't touch her candy. Right? So um, for me, it's that we really have to um, look at this as a holistic thing. It's the, it's the women in trade, but it's women in investment. How much investment is really coming to Africa then to, uh, to black um, owned women led businesses. You have to look at the figures. It's, I think less than 3% is coming to us in Africa. So all these things are things that we have to take note of, and it really all does matter um, in, in the way we harness technology. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Ulluri. Thank you for spotlighting those um, gender-specific challenges when it comes to um, technology and digital innovation for women in trade on the continent. And um, I mean, particularly for us to talk about um, trade on the continent, investment, women have got their own peculiar challenges, and those are some of the points she had um, touched on, having worked with women across different countries on the African continent. I mean, we're going to have um, some discussion around that and we'll be able to ask questions, but then we'll take the presentation from other panelists. So we'll take the presentation from Adebayo Adeleke, the Chief Executive Officer of Supply Chain Africa. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Awesome, awesome. I just, I just don't want us to kind of fall asleep. So uh, it's awesome to be here. Uh, I bring good tidings from our base uh, in Nigeria, Zambia, Rwanda, and the United States. Uh, supply chain Africa. Uh, we came about it about a year ago. Uh, uh, my background, a bit about my background, retired from the U.S. military after 20 years, uh, kind of went back, kind of, you know, I don't know what came upon me, but one of go back and do some stuff on the continent. And uh, in the process of trying to kind of decipher, there's so much going on on the continent. Now, of course, uh, prior to COVID-19, of everything that was going on, and then we begin to realize that the linear economy and the linear supply chain that we've been running has literally failed us. Uh, as we come as this part of this whole uh, Forum 22 is to kind of expand the recovery system. So became supply chain Africa, we now realize that mm -hmm. African supply chain has been fragmented, it's been disjointed, and it's not actually it's not economic for, for the continent. It's not, it doesn't posture the continent for prosperity. And uh, funny enough, you know, trade has always been discussed in isolation, and I, I've, I'm a firm believer that trade and supply chain are two sides of a coin. You cannot trade without supply chain. You can trade, is all theory, but when you need something to move, you need to move from point A to point B, and supply chain is in between. So oftentimes I find out that everybody talks about trade, but what actually moves trade is being ignored. As we continue to see on the continent, as we discuss 
Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is another uh, kind of worms in itself as we all kind of working towards it and making sure that it's right, it's right for Africa. But at the same time, what are the engine that is driving is the supply chain in Africa is supposed to be a consolidating point, a platform whereby we bring together, we bring to light, we bring to fore everything that is right, everything that is wrong, anything that is of opportunity for supply chain in Africa. We understand our nuances, we understand our uniqueness, we understand our challenges, our constraints, and we're not shying away from it. And I think what has happened in the past is the fact that Africa has become an adaptation and an adaptation our continent, that everybody dumps the ideology on there. Oh, we think this thing is good for Africa, let's just dump it over there. But nobody, over the course of time, has ever asked Africa, what is good for you? What do you want to do, actually? And I think that in the supply chain system and methodologies, over the course of time, and I'll bring you back in history, not try to bore you, but in the 13th century or so like that, when people, when Africa actually contacted the rest of the world, it was through trade. It was through trade, the Sub-Sahara, the, Trans the Trans-Sahara, and all these other stuff. Of course, the slave trade came about. Africa interaction with the rest of the world is through trade. So you cannot have Africa without trade. Today, everywhere you go in Africa, everybody hustles every day. It's through trade. You go in in the morning to trade one thing or the other. Either your time, your energy, your craft, your creativity. It's all about trading. So Africa has always been synonymous with trade. And you cannot have that without supply chain. And... So I always tell people, people always live and chocolate. I say Africa is supply chain ideal if you look at it in, in a point of way. So, but all these things have happened in the past. I mean, we know that civilization grew up in Africa, but all of a sudden, Africa became this continent that doesn't know how to do anything. All of a sudden. So what happened to these methodologies that have produced the, the pyramids, the terracottas, the, the heart, the fine arts of this world that we yet to know how to find it again? And then we realize that because of our westernization and colonization, some of these methodologies have been subjugated over the course of time. And this has been what has really helped us. So in our research, we found out that uh, a lot of these things are interwoven in our cultural norms, our nuances and uniqueness. Uh, a lot of you have worked, have dealt uh, some kind of way with the continent. You probably have some things that you like, something you don't like, but there's something about it that would why to bring about the supply chain in Africa is that Africa has its own peculiarities and uniqueness, and that's what makes it different. So it's either you embrace it or you shy away from it. It is what it is. And at the moment, you kind of, kind of understand those nuances and uniqueness. I think you'll be able to do better in Africa. And the more we kind of look at the transportation systems, uh, the procurement systems, and whatnot, we realize that you cannot separate these systems from their cultural norms. They have been ingrained over centuries. And the moment you try to break those things away with all these new methodologies that are coming out, nothing against Western methodologies, but there are ways to kind of merge with African cultural norms that make sense. If the moment you kind of dissociate with that, you're not going to find any traction on the continent. And that's what Supply Chain is, Africa is trying to do, trying to showcase all these stories of people that are doing great things, that by using different methodologies, merged with no cultural norms, and make it something unique and different. The ride share that is now most popular in Lyft and Uber actually has been going on in Tanzania for, for centuries. You know, some of these things are not new. So how much more of indigenous methods are in Africa that has not been used? And that's why Supply Chain Africa is helping. One of our pillars is digital, is, is a, of course digital. We cannot innovate on the continent without having data. And a lot of you that work on the continent understand that. Uh, historically, Africa, most of what we do is from word of mouth. From our eulogies and our custom and norms, nothing has been documented. It's always from words of mouth. And that has actually affected us till now. That the issue of actually documenting historical facts and data uh, is, is, a foreign, is a foreign concept. To, even to our history, our history is not written by us, but written by somebody else, given to us that this is who we are. You know, so we're, it is high time for Africa to be using data, and without data, we cannot innovate. It's the basis of the next Web 3.0 and whatnot that is going forward. So we are leading the charge in that sense, making sure that our logistics data, our translation data has been documented so that we can come up with innovative methodologies to drive change on the continent. It's a new frontier, and we are at supply, in supply chain Africa, we are bracing this course to make sure that we are at the cops of it. Because if we miss this particular window of opportunity, we probably will have missed it for, 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 
for decades and centuries to come. We missed it in the 18th century. We know that. But this is another chance for us to actually make it right. And I believe supply chain, Africa, if, if Africa is supply chain, now we are the cops of it and making sense of it. By understanding we have over 100 million, at least 100 million supply chain professionals on the continent. And the moment you go to the North Africa, the East Africa, the Central Africa, the South Africa, you realize that they all have different challenges. Folks in the Sahel and the Northern Africa have their own challenge, security challenge. Folks in, in Horn of Africa, Sudan, Israel, and uh, Ethiopia, they have their issues they're dealing with over there. And then the city communities have their own issues. And these things are not, they're not, you know, I mean, you read the news every day, you see it every day and there. And I believe that the moment we begin to understand this concept and these challenges, we can proffer better solutions for it. And oftentimes, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't require that much, it's just looking at who we are as people. So that's why, you know, in Supply Chain Africa, we try to use our Africa, the, the business, the people, and our uniqueness. And oftentimes, we don't, our uniqueness, we've been always shy away from it because it's not what the world has accepted. But I think the more we embrace who we are as individuals, the more we can offer the world and the more we can actually offer solutions for ourselves. So that's all about my, I hope I've not lost my seven minutes. Yeah, I mean, right on time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And now we'll take the presentation. So before that presentation from um, Abiodun and Dominique, um, um, Adebayo Adeleke mentioned that without data, we cannot innovate. And one thing that we are seeing, I mean, recently, even with COVID and all, is a lot of innovation that has been led by young people. And I see that, yes, I mean, you've done a lot of programs with young people on the continent, youth innovating, youth leading businesses. So, like, speaking to that also as you make your presentation. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so maybe just I'll start with a question to everyone. Um, for those of you who are very conversant with um, problems in Africa when it comes to young people and entrepreneurship, um, an average of me would pose a question or a challenge to everyone, and they'll tell you they have a biggest need when it comes to scaling up their business. Mm -hmm. Who knows what that need is? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Capital and finance. Um, but I, I, I put it to you. I stand to be corrected. In my years of engaging with entrepreneurs on the continent, um, and that's work spanned through South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, Tanzania, touching all the major regions. Um, the, the real problem with scaling up when it comes to intra African trade and also scaling up to international markets is not really finance. It's actually capacity that most of these entrepreneurs don't have. Um, if you um, currently the digital um, economy space in, in Africa. Is about $115 billion, and there's a projection mm -hmm. that by 2050, it will be over $700 billion. During COVID, when the world was shut down, many, I mean, African startups are still raising money. Last year, $4 billion was being raised by startups even during COVID, and that was about two or three times more than what was raised a year before. And so that, that puts some perspective for what we're discussing right now. And um, um, coming from um, the African background, um, I think Colorius did mention something around capacity building in terms of certification and all of that. And what I've come to understand is also the fact that when it comes to scaling up, um, most venture capitalists right now have a major demand. I've worked with family funds, and what they tell African startups or SMEs is, are you, are you scalable? Nobody's interested in the fact that you have a product that is very strong in Lagos, and you're controlling the market. They're more interested in the next three years, are you able to go to Kampala? If you're in Accra, they're asking, do you have the potential to go to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania? If you're in Tanzania, they're asking you, can you go to Rwanda in Kigali? And most of them miss that opportunity because right from the point of creation, there's no, you don't have the international mindset. And definitely this would not be tackled just at the startup level. Um, every major stakeholder in the room and out of this room we all have our own part of the, I mean, the pie to take home. Um, there's a governmental part, which obviously has to do with um, creating an enabling environment. Technology in itself um, is really not a solution in itself. It, like we all know, it's an enabler. You can only scale what is already working. You can only scale what is functional. People don't scale failure. And so if we're talking about scaling and trying to enter into new markets and open new frontiers, the most important question is, is it tested, is it pro has it proved 
the test of sustainability. Is it scalable indeed? And that's why it's very important to understand a place where you know, policy takes a major you know, part of the point, which is about creating that um, soft landing for companies to be able to thrive. Uh, an example, I, I, I mean, I, I'm based in Paris, and I know um, for some of us who drink champagne, <laughs> you know, champagne itself is, is from a region in France called Champagne, and that's the name of the village. And the EU and the French government sort of has been able to have what is called the geographical indication to ensure that that particular product is protected with a very strong label. So if you take any champagne that is not from Champagne in France, is a fake one. <laughs> so what that does to the village and to France is the export potential, because it's, and that's only that's only policy can do that. Not the passion of the SME, not the zeal. It's about people coming together, African stakeholders coming together, and understanding that we need to be able to work around comparative advantage. Some of us have countries that are very gifted in different things based on demography and the sectors that you know that are improving, and it's very important that government understand the place that policy plays in being able to create a soft landing for these SMEs to be able to thrive. And I want us to also know that there's a difference between an African startup and an African founder. Most of the North, we celebrate companies um, just because they have a black face or they have, you know, they, they, are, they are seen as an African SME and they're scaling. But um, if you check the records, you, you'd see that most of the ones we celebrate are not even African. Yeah. You can have a Nigerian founder who has a startup based in France and is doing business in Nigeria. The company is not Nigerian. Mm -hmm. So even though he's taking over the markets, mm -hmm. and some of them would have such opportunities because they get support from overseas. They get support from venture capitalists. And Africa as a whole is losing so much um, you know, potential because of you know, there is no that enabling environment. And so one time when we celebrate a, a Rwandan, I mean a Cameroonian startup, we need to ask ourselves, are we celebrating the founder or the startup? And that's the part of policy. And that's just one aspect. There is a part of, obviously, capacity building, which involves um, the DFIs of this world. I've done a lot of work with the likes of the World Bank and um, the IOM, and a very impressive um, job the ITC is also doing, International Trade Center, respect to helping startups to be able to grow capacity to go into the international market. And that, you, it will shock you to know that some startups think they're ready, but once you have some level of interactions with them in terms of, like Wallory was saying, certifications and what they need to understand with respect to playing in the in, in international market, they have, they're not ready, they're not even ready. And in my own experience, I, when I work with African startups, I tell you that I have more funds are willing to be collected than the credible startups or SMEs who can actually collect those funds just because they've not passed the test of you know, um, the capacity that they have to be able to go into new markets. And one way um, which I think, coincidentally, everybody on this table seems to be, um, well, aside um, Jan Hoffman, um, seems to have a bit of the diaspora element. So I see Lori, she talked about leaving the UK to come to Nigeria. I see also Adeleke saying um, obviously the same thing from the US. And that's also one thing we've also uh, probably have missed in all of these deliberations around after the continental free trade agreement. There is a lot of value that is diaspora and African have to give to African startups. Um, most often in the North, uh, in my experience, I've seen startups try to you know, cross border and they go through a lot of obstacles to be able to even get the right partners. Um, and it, it goes beyond a due diligence on, on Google. You need guys who are foot soldiers, and that's where the diaspora plays a key role. When I talk to startups now, um, SMEs, I tell them, I know you're trying to raise $100,000, um, and it's a very tough one to convince um, stakeholders, to convince venture capitalists. But do you mind, rather than you raise $100,000 from one um, company, you can have Africans from your country who are already in diaspora give you $10,000 each. So you can have $10,000 from Moroccans, who are based abroad, and then you still have your money. And, and the reason why it's easy for us to do that in my organization is because the diaspora sort of have a, a very gentle bias towards their own country. So rather than, they don't want to go back directly. I mean, Olori took a very big, <laughs> um, very big um, I mean, effort to be able to relocate back. But some still want to be able to give back. 
And there is, you know, a very a gap that we've not minded in terms of what the diaspora can do. We know about diaspora remittance, but it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop there. Diaspora has different kinds of capital. The social capital that they have is unquantifiable yeah. in terms of solar. I will give you a last example. I worked with a, um, a Nigerian startup recently who was trying to set up um, a fintech company in Europe. And they did all the due diligence. They came to Europe. They had, I mean, they were serious for them to have gone through the embassy and all the bureaucratic efforts to come to Europe. They went around for meetings. They had no partner. They didn't have something that was fit into, I mean, that, that, that was aligned with what they were trying to do. And so once they were tired, after, after three weeks of staying in Europe, they, <laughs> I had a chat with them. I told them, okay, just give me 24 hours. And in 24 hours, I signed a meeting with them, and they had a deal with a very big financial tech partner in the Europe. And all I was trying to make them understand is you really don't have to travel this far. Mm. All of you have diaspora. The diaspora from the Gambians who are very strong in Germany. Uh, I think it's something stakeholders like um, WTO, um, AU should also be to look at to be able to mine that gap in terms of financing, in terms of also knowledge, capital that diaspora can play when it comes to helping some of our startups be able to break through you know, this rigorous um, scale up efforts in international markets. That's what brings so much value in terms of capital, in terms of knowledge, in terms of relationship, um, which is unquantifiable. And I think once we get some of these fabrics right, uh, I, I think that we can be able to talk about more traction and have more scalable startups who can be, become the next unicorn like we have in already about seven of them in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abiodun, for that presentation. And now we'll take the presentation from Dan. One of the things that um, Abiodun spotlighted is the challenge of capacity on the continent. Now we've, I mean, listened to diverse um, experiences of uh, people who have been at the forefront of tra driving trade and sustainable development agenda on the continent. One of the objectives of this working session is to be able to also take example from the multilateral system to be able to um, to be able to um, impact on how we can address technology and digital innovation on the continent. And Jan is going to bring, bring in that perspective to for, for us. He's the head of the trade logistic branch of the, and the Division for Technology and Logistics of, the, of UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. So thank you, Jan. No, thank you, uh, Bibi Sola. Happy to, to be here. As uh, requested, yeah, I have prepared some thoughts about um, bringing it a bit to the WTO with a specific focus also what uh, Adebayo talked about, supply chains, uh, trade logistics. So I, I thought, let me divide into three steps. Uh, first, why we need to be ambitious. Then about the second point is really about the chicken and the egg. And I think all the presentations here talked about this challenge. Uh, you need capacity to get the financing, but then you need the financing to, to build the capacity. And finally, some technology solutions on this issue. So let's start with why we need to be ambitious. Um, I like to say that technological progress will never be as slow as today. Is it slow? It's not slow, it's fast. And this, uh, this is a photo I took here in front of the WTO. They were just jumping and running and somehow I, I caught them with my Nikon um, on a Sunday afternoon. But there they are running and realize technological progress will be even faster in the future. So staying with here the WTO, uh, the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement, the TFA, when it was negotiated since 2004, there were delegates, including from Africa, who said, oh no, I cannot commit to publishing on the internet the rules and regulations and duties of customs. Now, I thought already in 2004 that this would be a bad idea to oppose because it's especially small companies that, want, that you want to export from Burundi to Malaysia, you don't have a uh, chamber of commerce or embassy in, in Kuala Lumpur. You want to be able to have the information on the internet. So finally, yes, there is now Article 1 in the WTO TFA that obliges every country in the world, every customs administration, to publish what are the rules and the duties. And an example with support from UNCTAD is the Kenya trade information portal. So 
the negotiation, the ratification, implementation of new regulations, WTO conventions take time. We need to commit to whatever is the best future technological solution. No? So 2004, maybe Internet was something complicated, but it's not anymore, and it took 10 years to, to negotiate. So um, here comes my favorite WTO article. Look, some people have a favorite football club, favorite restaurant, favorite car brand. I have a favorite TFA article. It's 10.1. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 10.1 is the one and only article in the TFA that will still be relevant in 100 years from now. Because many of the others, we will have said, we tick off. I have a single window, I have advanced ruling, I have pre-arrival processing. This one says I must always try and minimize the incidence and complexity of procedures. Continuously review, continuously keep reducing, continuously see what is the least trade restrictive methods, and a lot of this has to do with technology. Sorry, somehow the font here, uh, so I'm, I'm highlighting the second point about the chicken and the egg, trade logistics, technology, and development. So that's from a study we did a few years ago. Um, it shows correlation, and I'm, I'm aware that correlation is not necessarily ca causation, causality, uh, I also know that all those people that confuse correlation with causation, causation will eventually die. Now that's a joke, but uh, because there's no causality there. Anyhow, so on the left axis, you have the, num the, the sort of TF implementation, and on the Y axis, you have, for example, the percent of individuals using Internet. And I believe it does go both ways. If a country has more usage of Internet for different reasons. It is also more ready to implement uh, electronic submission, e-documents, digital automation, and so on. But when we implement the W2TFA, we will gain the capacity, there's a mechanism, there's a special differential treatment to provide this capacity. And we have real-life examples where the fact that customs allows for like direct trader input incentivize small in enterprises to connect to the Internet. So I do think there's a causality. There are several of these with GDP, with development, with corruption. If a country is less corrupt, it is more likely to implement certain automation and other solutions. And if we implement some of these solutions, like the right of appeal, more transparency, we reduce corruption. So it's all very much the, what we like to say, the dynamic nature of trade facilitation. Uh, countries that trade more have a higher return on investment, and they get more investment, and then they can trade more effectively. The challenge is for us in UNCTAD and our dear member countries to make the upward the positive virtuous cycle and not a downward spiral, which we sometimes also have. Some very small, very poor countries, you are stuck. at the, There are new demands, new technologies. You don't get them. You don't get the trade. And traders, shipping companies, providers leave you. Know. So that then leads me to some solutions, technologies for, for trade logistics. Have a paper letter or have a distributed letter on, on the blockchain. These are different levels of, of solutions. Um, who leads the IT reform in your country or company? Is it the CEO, the CTO, or was it COVID-19? <laughs> COVID-19. <laughs> and, and really, we had a lot of additional demand in UNCTAD for our various solutions during the last two years. We also, I must acknowledge, got new funding, support, including from the UN so-called development account in New York, to respond. And I think we can proudly say we had quite some good solutions with the regional commissions, with ECA, with ESCAP, with others, uh, to promote, the, like, work, benefit from existing solutions to help, yeah, to help with what? Here we had our 10-point action plan. We wrote it ten, uh, two, day, uh, two years ago, starting from the ship, going through the port, leaving the port, transit, crossing a country, landlocked country, regulatory framework, reaching the company, and a lot of this is digital solutions. No? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, then we could build on existing solutions, and I, I sold my project to, to New York, saying we are jumping on the running train, and could then work with single windows, with existing solutions, which were even more important in times 
of COVID. I won't go through all these technical solutions, uh, but I want to highlight one, one picture here, one, one message, and I, I hope uh, Adebayo from Supply Chain w would agree. Uh, even here in this building, and I'm not sure if there are WTO colleagues in the room, I have seen WTO colleagues showing a balance in a PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. A balance saying either I facilitate trade and invest in digital solutions, or I control and protect my population from under the flare or COVID or contraband or whatever. It's really the wrong picture. There's not a single solution we are promoting from risk management to more transparency to pre-arrival processing to automation to advanced rule. All of these help achieve both. You know, they help achieve better controls like risk management, classical one. If you do a right risk management, you reduce the number of containers you open, but you increase the likelihood of catching the bad guys. And, and nothing in the WTO agreement, nothing in the World Customs Organization, it's a fact, ANCTA tools. We don't say you should not control. Nothing says it. We provide tools that help with both. Way of example, a little bit, if you allow me, a little bit of a sales pitch, so ANCTA, ASICUDA, some real life successes, examples, like additional revenue, additional um, is, uh, certificates issues, shorter times, more electronic certificates, and, and so on. So one more thing about technology in terms of logistics trade facilitation. Now, not on the supply side. Yes, many of the trade facilitation, transport solutions, port automation, port community systems, they have technology. But also the things we trade are more and more technology-based. So what, what do we see here? What is this thing we see on the left? If, is, are there any customs officers in the room? Anybody wants to out himself? <laughs> no? No customs officer? Somebody might know. I, I used to know. I, I'm not a customs officer. No. But, uh, so, so there's this harmonized system, and uh, these things have a cause. The thing arrives at the border, first time, the customs officer doesn't know what it is. What, what should I give this? The, like a, a what? A toy? A computer? A game? A jewelry? And depending on what HS system number I give, it pays a different duty. Mm -hmm. So for this, for example, we have the measure advanced ruling in the WTO TFA. You know. So also, I just want to add this aspect of technology. More and more such products also make trade facilitation more important. To sum up, I've shared with you why we need to be more ambitious, and why I think we can and really should be more ambitious. Then this challenge, which is also an opportunity to get a positive, virtuous circle, and finally, yeah, that the demand for these has really grown during WTO, and as I was asked, by maybe we'll bring it back to multilateral and capacity building, mm -hmm. there is really a very positive role. I myself, not WTO, I'm, I'm UNCTAD, but we love each other, we work together, <laughs> we promote the, the TFA, and, and believe it is a very good thing under this topic that we have been discussing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that, that guy Thank you very much. Thank you. And, you know, um, one of the many things, I mean, you've talked about, you um, closed your presentation with saying, emphasizing the need why we need to be more ambitious as um, a continent, and also spotlighting that in the light of the um, new agreement on the continent, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, speaking as to the agenda on the continent, Agenda 2063 of the African We Want, African Economic Integration. So um, two months ago, yeah, about two months ago, we had the Global Head for Trade Review here at the WTO, and um, there was an African session also. And um, on that panel during the session, there was a remark that was made which stood out for me even as we were working towards planning this working session today is the fact that if we do not get it right from now as a continent and speaking as to the team of harnessing digital innovation and technology when 2063 comes we are still going to keep talking about potential potential as a continent and that i took from a presentation of First, someone we have also in our midst today, the Chief of Staff of the WTO, who is going to be giving a brief remark, uh, Dr. Bright Okogu. Thank you very much for coming.
Thank you. Should I speak from here? I mean, okay. Yes, we may need yeah. a microphone. Yeah, microphone. Yeah. Microphone. yeah. Maybe. The microphone for yeah. the. Thank you. For the interpreters, I guess. Uh, okay. No, I can. You can. I'm good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Jan. Um, I thought I stood behind you, especially as you said that we love each other. <laughs> Hong Tad and uh, WTO. Um, this little remark basically um, is, was meant to have been done before this moment. When yesterday, uh, Baby Sola called me to please uh, join this, I thought, oh, you know, I, I, I'll try to make it after these other meetings. And um, it's very good to be in the midst of all of our friends and uh, colleagues. Some we met uh, when we had the Aid, aid for Trade uh, Week uh, about two months ago. Yes, I did make those uh, comments, not just in that session, but indeed in another two others where I also uh, spoke that um, a lot of what we talk about and hear about when it comes to Africa is about potential. And um, the statement I made then was that you cannot eat potential and you cannot drink uh, potential. The time is long past for us to be talking about um, a lot of these things concerning the continent and sort of making them look like they are in the future. The needs are now, and this is when we need to address all of the issues that need to be addressed. It cannot be that we continue to talk about potential, and our young people are crossing the Mediterranean and all kinds of places, simply to look for, they don't want to wait for potential anymore, and they are going further out to get what they need to, to, to get for themselves, to live a very basic life at this, uh, at the, at this point. Um, one of the slides uh, that uh, Jan gave when he talked about uh, COVID being a driver of, um, of reform, you know, so I, it just occurred to me, I was asking whether should we encourage more COVID? <laughs> among ourselves, among the nations and, and situations so that we can have reforms? Of course, the answer is no. But that's the reality. Necessity was the mother of invention. And everybody turned to it. And I do think that the, the, the necessity today with high unemployment among our young people needs to be recognized for what it is. It is very, very dangerous. You need to be able to give hope to uh, to, to young people uh, for, for 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 a future that certainly. So let me thank uh, Gwemi and your and other uh, organisers of this particular uh, session for inviting us to participate, at least to come in to listen, which was the original intention. And once I agreed that I would be here, she then said, can you make a, a short remark? And I thought, this is getting a bit... Uh, <laughs> and then she then pushed, you know, can uh, DG come uh, also, can she? So I said, DG will not be here at this time. Uh, she's already gone I, I, and she ahead of me because we, are, we have uh, another event for this evening. I would say that um, the choice of your the to choice of topic is very very um, relevant. At this time, the role of technology and digital innovation to advance Africa's uh, uh, trade or even development. This, I think, is really uh, you know, given all the sessions we've had for this week, I think this is indeed very important. And the reason I think it's important is that. Um, it fits squarely with what we perceive to be the future of trade, as far as the WTO is concerned. The future of trade is digital, the future of trade is services, the future of trade is more inclusive than what we have today. And some of the things that I listened to, um, Olori, Olori, when I came in, really resonated with me because you're looking at um, 
women who, you know, if you have a product to sell on the internet, you know, through the internet or the platform, nobody needs to know whether you are a young uh, uh, boy, whether you are a woman, whether you are. It's your product that speaks for you. And as economists, as an economist, one of the things we look for is basically a sort of perfect, you know, open market uh, situation where a level playing field can be what determines the participation of people and how well uh, they do in the system. Now, I look at the MISMIS in Africa, for example. MISMIS, that is micro, small, medium enterprises. These are, that's really the backbone of our economies. It is not the government that employs maybe out of a population, let's say of Nigeria, of 200 plus million. Government maybe employs two or three million. What do you do with the others? It is this, the, the, the private sector with the um, small enterprises that are really the drivers of our economies. And I think uh, that's the reason I felt that the topic that you chose was indeed um, a, very, a, a very good one. Among the big challenges facing mankind today, of course, COVID has been mentioned, and its economic uh, cost is a major one. Climate change, uh, with all the things we are seeing, food insecurity, you know, think economic pressure, whether it's on the side of unemployment or high debt levels and so on. Africa has experienced all of these difficulties. And if I can single out the question about climate change, which I've said in some other sessions, that Africa is suffering from, even though it does not contribute to the problem. Now, but that's not a reason to not do something. We are here today, whatever happened in the past, happened. We need now to move forward. And moving forward is essentially the sort of things that these types of efforts are trying to solve. And technology, I think, provides an excellent opportunity for that type of addressing what you are facing today, rather than waiting or asking um, essentially for what happened in, in the in the past that basically you did not uh, contribute to. Um, Africa, I must say, is not waiting for solution to come from outside, not anymore. Why I say that is that you look at the work being done by the young people in particular, and you will see that lots and lots of things, <laughs> they're, they're, they're just becoming sort of organic. They're taking on a life of their own without waiting. And I believe that the modern technology or emerging technology um, has essentially provided that opportunity for head-to-head -head competition. In other words, if you are to empower the young people, they don't even wait for you to empower them. I don't mean empower in a, you know, that they have the opportunity, access to the basic tools to get on the platform. They actually do extremely well. You're looking at um, uh, some of the things that uh, Mr. Adebayo here was uh, talking about. They are real. You identify a space where there is a need, whether it's supply chain related type of things, or in fact, uh, um, in, in the case of uh, what you've indicated, diaspora um, um, uh, uh, Africans, there is a need for financing and you are able to tap into that space. Those types of opportunities are being grabbed, grabbed, um, grabbed by lots and lots of young people on the continent without um, uh, waiting for government in particular. What we like about the, the, the modern technology is that it's very democratic. That's the way I describe it in one of my uh, other uh, papers. It's very democratic. Anybody get, can get on it and then you are doing what you, 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 you can do. You're bringing your talent onto that particular space and moving uh, forward. Now, um, let me just mention that um, during the COVID uh, situation, it wasn't just the issue of reform that, that uh, COVID enabled. COVID allowed people to think differently, the delivering food stuff, foods to people, goods and uh, services, telemedicine, um, remote... Um, 
uh, meetings being held by very the un unlikeliest of places. One example, I'm sure all of you know it and you've done it, is family meetings. They, they get on, the, on Zoom or something and every week or every two weeks, irrespective of the locations of everybody, that they pull them together. This is an, it's an innovation. It did not happen because we planned it. It's because people are taking advantage of this situation. You don't have to wait for, uh, you, you know, your grandmother is in the village, you've not seen them for, for months and something. You know, the illness of the, uh, the older people is not real illness. Typically, they haven't seen you, and they are just wanting to see you. So you place that, you make the arrangement, and they are happy they see their children and their grandchildren. All of these things are being leveraged also at the economic uh, frontier. Let me just quickly talk about AFCFTA, which is meant to promote um, um, uh, free trade on the continent. Now, the digitalization effort that is going on is extremely important. Let me give you one example. Cost of, doing, of trading in Africa is extremely high. Some figures from the work we've done internally here in the WTO indicate that um, African countries, on average, they face tr uh, trade costs that are equivalent to a tariff of 354%. In other words, your problems of your own high cost is the equivalent of somebody imposing huge tariffs of 355, 354%. This is 2017 uh, figure. 375% in, uh, in agriculture in that space and then 264% in manufacturing. That's the equivalent. How can you compete if you have this type of constraint even before you enter the, the market? So these are the sort of things, and um, the estimate we've done here indicate that this is 50% higher than the cost of similar things in richer countries, because they don't have problems with the electricity, they don't have problems with you know, some of the things with security, they don't have difficulty with uh, the transportation, or in fact, my friend, he has, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the supply chain type of this. Those constraints are more severe in our countries. And it is one example of where this direction we are going to would be very helpful. So on our side here, we are providing support. We're using a convening power. We're discussing negotiating rules that will ensure that this new digital trade, that the rules are well understood and established. You mentioned the issue of capacity building and the other such things earlier. I think they are important, and I think our various countries, including where all of us are from, should participate more actively in the e-commerce conversations at the WTO. Let the voices be heard. Let the other people hear the voice and your issues of concern. And I think when we do this, we will really be trying to take advantage of the technological innovation that is the theme of this so let me close by saying that the WTO indeed believes in the young people of the world and the young people of Africa in particular, given that this is where a lot of the difficulties still uh, uh, exist. And um, I just want to encourage that all of us, we encourage them. I'm no longer, I have left that particular grouping of the young people of Africa, but uh, uh, just to indicate, let's encourage them to stay the course, go forward, go forward to create a future that we all uh, want to see. Thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Bright. I mean, speaking as to the purpose of this conversation is the need for intergenerational dialogue because we cannot build a connection to the future unless we also take examples from the past. So, yes, it's a youth session. It's a session talking about um, how we can unearth digital innovation and technology through young people's innovation. But then there are key examples that we'll have to be able to take. And thank you for spotlighting all of these issues in your presentation, despite the timing of the notice. Thank you so much. We're so grateful. And talking about what the um, WTO is doing, 
with respect to um, advancing trade in Africa. So may I crave your indulgence to introduce to you. So before then, um, if you read my bio, so um, being in Switzerland, I'm currently conducting a doctoral research focused on international trade and investment in Africa. And um, in the room today, we have the my professor, my PhD supervisor, who is a senior counselor at the World Trade Organization, Professor Gabriel Marcel. Yeah, seated with us. So I'd like you to maybe give a brief remark as being in the session and honoring my invitation to attend my session today. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I didn't know you. You're <laughs> sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> good, to, good to have you here. One of my PhDs. Indeed, indeed. She said high things about you. Congratulations. Yeah. To, her, to me, <laughs> congratulations to her. To her, to her. Yeah, yes. the challenge. But um, the one thing I think that I keep is what you just said, because I think Dr. Bright and the DG they value very much the young people, and it's good with dig digitalization. And if you know me, you will understand. Still have issues with that. But the the wise comment, your last comment, is that. We need both. We need experience. And I think Africa has always had a very important respect for older people. So how to reconcile everything, I think that's going to be the answer of your PhD. Yes, <laughs> you get it. <laughs> so yes, I mean, I've just started the PhD my first year, so and that is one of the things that birthed um, this um, working session. So um, we're going to take contribution, like just maybe questions, one or two questions, because we're, um, our time is fast spent, and we have a reception after this, which will be at the atrium, so please just relax, take your time, and then, so we welcome contribution, questions to the panelists from the audience, if you have any. Comment, contribution, questions to any of the panelists or on any of the presentation. Any question? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Carol. I work for uh, the WTO in the uh, Intellectual Property and Government Procurement Division. It was uh, a very interesting session, so thank you very much to all of you. And I have a quick uh, question. Um, it was mentioned, this uh, gender divide, uh, digital divide, and um, I'd like to have uh, your experiences or even uh, opinions concerning another kind of divide, uh, the public-private digital divide, um, because also the public sector uh, can uh, contribute because it represents a very important part of the economy, uh, but sometimes uh, we can see that uh, there is a kind of delay in uh, this uh, digitalization process. So uh, my question is, uh, how can we make uh, different actors uh, uh, dance together or like uh, in, at the same or similar pace? Thank you very much. Can I make a comment on yes, this sure. important okay. point? Uh, because she's also from Nigeria, the DG, when she arrived, one of the amazing things is that within, I think, one or two weeks, a group of countries asked her to bring on board the private sector in the vaccine world. This was for vaccine uh, producers, distributors, which was in a way a revolution because for years some countries have asked the private sector to come. There has been resistance. She ignored that and said, we need you. We need you. And then the work on supply chain in this place, which has traditionally been just government to government, supply chain is about companies buying this instead of that. And now the World Bank and IMF have asked the DG to deal with the broader supply chain issue. So I'm glad, I mean, it's not your question, but it's this relationship private-public, which is mandatory for dealing with COVID, and not only IGOs to IGOs or state to state, the whole mix, the whole, all the actors, and climate change, and all the problems are more and more calling for uh, changing the 
traditional WTO approach. Yeah, uh, okay. ju just to uh, caveat to that, uh, ma'am, is the fact that I think what COVID-19 has taught us globally is the fact that we cannot continue to work in isolations. Government cannot continue to talk to government without uh, seeking opinions outside their, their own world. As you can see, I'll use United States, for example, or the Trump administration when this COVID was really, let me put it this way, was really potent. Uh, he reached out to Pfizer and all these pharmaceutical companies to come up with solutions, knowing fully well that he understands the constraints and, let me say, the challenge of his own organization, of his own government, that it might not be because of governmental constraints, these laws, you have to go back and modify these laws and all these things will, will act as a constraint and time is not on our side. So the private organizations have no constraint. They have, as long as you can provide them the money, they will go forth and do great things. So we're able to understand those challenges to be able to reach a deal to get a, fat, a, a vaccine out in a, in a speedy manner. So it's imperative as we go on in Africa, as we are championing democracy and you know this rule of law and all these things becoming, let me call it gradually maturing, let me just put it that way, for lack of a better word, gradually maturing. It's important for these, our countries to understand the relationship between the government and the private sector. You know, we are not enemies of each other. We actually work together to, to from as you can see, I mean, the most advanced democracies, the private sectors are the ones pushing and mm -hmm. lobbying for rules that have been enacted to favor, for them to have a favorable working environment. So this will continue, it's an ongoing, it's like a tangle. It will continue to be like that for, for a while until we get to that final stage. But I don't think we are there yet. Mm -hmm. But for, for, for sustainable trade going forward, it will be, and I think right now, especially as we champion in Africa free trade agreement, these private to government uh, conversations need to start because I'm beginning to see, I'm beginning to hear some news about what is going on in some trades that is going on within African countries that is not going to be funny down the road if some of these conversations are not held at this point. And after it's not really been kicked off yet, really. And those conversations, and those countries are already raising red flags, like, whoa, whoa, you know. So those kind of things. So, I, I, and I think that that's the, that's the way forward. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Adiba Adiliki. So we'll just take um, your response to yeah, the question, I mean, the question, and more or less like a closing remark also from you for the session on how we can leverage um, partnership for the purpose of bridging the digital divide or announcing technology. And we'll also take from John and Olori to close the session so we can then move to the reception. All right. So thank you for the question. Just to um, answer the question briefly, so I think one other way to bridge the gap between public and private um, stakeholders would be to have more, ensure that both parties have an open mind. I mean, you never can tell the effects of forums like this where you have multi stakeholders on the table. Um, I'm also always an advocate of, you know, seek to understand before you make a conclusion. So rather than, oh, we don't understand the blockchain technology or e-currency, shut it down. Like it happened in my country. What's happening on Twitter? Shut it down. <laughs> so bring the guys to the table. Let's see what the pros and cons. And then there could be room for negotiation and also shifting ground. So that's to answer your question. And I think firms like this makes a lot of difference when all parties are on the table hearing the same thing at the same time. Um, one last word, I, I think I'll just hang that on what Dr. Bright said, um, that um, he mentioned a very interesting, I think I wrote that down, um, the future of trade is services. Mm. So as we obviously develop more partnerships in technology, the future of Africa also is service. Mm. Currently, the, um, the developed world, I think um, services account for three over four, um, three quarter of their the employment ratio. Mm -hmm. And it's not no longer ag agriculture, it's not manufacturing, it's services that play a major role in GDP over agriculture and manufacturing and also even employment. So as we begin to strengthen the ties of, you know, ad cost sectors mm -hmm. like, um, you know, agriculture, fintech, we also need to be able to look at, you know, non-traditional sectors like creative industry, mm -hmm. you know, and begin to also ensure that technology is being streamed in yeah. those um, you know, underrated circles because they do also have potential for employment and for turning around economic fabrics. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Abiodo. John. Um, yeah, on, on this public-private, I'm actually not sure if I understood the question. Are you saying 
public is less advanced or more advanced than the private sector? <laughs> I would say it depends. Uh, it depends that, uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Because I was a bit shooting in, in this yeah. direction. Within the public sector, without wanting to generalize, but very often we find that customs, for example, tend to be more advanced, more professionalized, have more IT systems at the border and ports then say Ministry of Health or, or Ministry of Agriculture and, and who are still more paper-based and, and mm -hmm. more bureaucratic. So within the public sector, they're different. And with the, in the private sector, obviously, between city and rural, we just said how many people do not yet have internet access, but at the same time, probably within the private sector, we have a wider uh, bell curve with more extremely advanced and also not at all advanced. That, that was one, one thought. Uh, one, one idea for the next uh, session, long discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. We are all promoting and very much in favor of, of digital and, and e-commerce and all these things. There is a challenge in terms of, of duties and taxes. You know, yes. The small parcels, yes. uh, the, the minimis, digital trade, do you pay? So we have to keep this mm. in mind. The, mm. the smaller and poorer country is, the mm. more its government revenues depend on duties collected at yeah. the border. Yeah. Whereas in Europe, I've read the, the total cost of the customs machinery at the European Union is higher than the duties they collect. <laughs> because, okay, they also do other tasks. They, they do uh, protection of property rights and what have you and security. But whereas in, I remember having seen Burundi, uh, it's really the more than half of the government revenue is collected there. So, mm. so that's one, one topic. Um, no, I, I stop it here. We need to have Thank our, our red wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, um, Thank you. Um, uh, so I, I firmly believe that because of the, um, the lack of infrastructure level, the deficiency that we have, uh, whether in physical, soft, whatever kind of infrastructure, to aid technology actually boosting anything in Africa. Um, we do need PPPs uh, of various sorts, but, you know, um, incentivizing this process, whether on the part of the private or on the part of the public, to say, if we do it, this is what we'll get. Um, and, you know, I'm going to just say it as it is. It all boils down to profiting. It's really about who's going to profit if we do this. That's the mindset that a lot of these um, different, you know, actors have who's going to profit even when we talk about climate change it's you know the arguments are there for for aeons but i think um of course you know we the uh, miss me's we the smes we the women we the youth we're like look we need you all on the table to actually get down and talk and you know thankfully you know like professor mentioned about um, the DG being able to be uh, someone who can bring that conversation and almost not mandate, but she can actually say, guys, come on, let's talk about this, you know. Um, it's, very, it's very important, you know, because the policy frameworks that are in the countries are not strong enough or not in favor of the, you know, other actors apart from themselves. So I just wanted to say that. But in terms of you know, harnessing um, uh, what we're here to talk about today. I think it also starts from enrolling and ensuring that the girl child has access to digital literacy now. When we're talking about a sustainable development agenda, we must start looking at a future that is already happening, you know, um, now. So I think um, one of the things I just wrote here is access to educational technologies and access to technologies as an endowment, right, um, and being able to use that. Um, and I think the the other thing I want to say is, you know, just looking at for for the women in um, in 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 Africa, technology is supposed to be an enabler, but there's just a mindset that it's for them and not for us, right? Um, or there's a misunderstanding as to the output it could pro possibly give, you know, to their businesses. Uh, so there also has to be a reorientation. I know how many times I'm having to tell, you know, and don't worry, Professor, you're not the only one who has issues with tech in terms of just finding your way through it. You know, we're constantly having to explain that, no, do it this way now, as opposed to the way you've always known. And there's just always this almost like kickback. 
So we are trying to, in, in order for us to harness anything, is first of all understanding, just basic understanding. And you'd be shocked because everyone here is in this room for two reasons. One, because you wanted to be here, but because, second, you have the ability that ability is what helped you book your ticket. It's what helped you know the agenda for today. But the women in business in Africa don't even understand that that is a tool to help their businesses. So I really think before we get to the very advanced conversations, we really have to go, like, scale it back, <laughs> like a few bits, you know, back, um, and not take for granted this access that we have in technology um, as an enabler. For some people, it's really looking like a conflict conversation um, to what they used to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rory. Thank you to our um, distinguished panelists. So um, a lot of issues have been spotlighted in the course of the conversation today. I mean, I would not be talking about everything all you know, the panelists have talked about again. But then, particularly we're concluding on the importance of partnership in, in bridging this um, digital gap and digital um, divide on the continent. I mean, speaking as to even gender-specific issues, the challenges peculiar to um, addressing technology for the future for sustainable development, reiterating the point about we're talking um, about why we need to focus on the young girls even from now in terms of the access to technology and I ask an implication for the future. And young people having access in terms of capacity as spotlighted also by um, Abiodun and um, Adebayo Adeleke speaking as to the importance of supply chain, I mean the movement of goods and services. And then we've been able to listen to Jan talking about very great examples that we can take from multilateral system through UNCTAD. We've listened to the WTO as lighted by Dr. Bright and then um, my professor here. Examples that we can take from multilateral system as a continent are nursing this technology and nursing digital innovation as young people and also supporting every initiative that, that is of young people. And moving from ambition to um, action is not just about words there are a whole lot of things that come into play, rules, policy. How are we going to go back to the continent? For those of us who are, for those of us in the diaspora that you are able to influence things on the continent, how are you able to take these examples that we have discussed here today? And that is why we have brought everyone from with their diverse experience to the table to discuss this. Take these examples from multilateralism, take it back home and speak to our government, speak to policymakers, support young people and not just supporting them by telling them, yes, you can do it for us. To, um, at, at the plenary session on the first day, Mbolo mentioned something about moving from ambition to action, as including financing these actions. So, and those are some of the things that was also spotlighted so today. Finance is very important, driving this policy as we go, and then we keep the conversation going. This is just um, the starting point. So on that note, we draw the curtain for today's working session. The African Digital Technology Working Session on Nursing Technology and Digital Innovation to Advance African Trade and Sustainable Development Agenda. And um, so that by 2023, we would not be talking about potential, but we would say, yes, we have the Africa that we want. And um, we believe that by then, yes, Africa will be not just the next, but will be that um, frontier of global prosperity. Thank you very much, and it's good. So, thank you. 